A Klingon glob fly is similar to a mosquito. Apparently, wild elephant is another term for rogue. And Stan Riga is the funniest performer ever. Oh, you never heard of him? <laughs> Hello, everybody. It was because he's from the uh, 23rd century. Hello, everybody, and welcome to the seventh rule from with Sirach Lofton. Hello, hello. My name is Ryan T. Husk. I'm not the funniest performer, that's for damn sure. Uh, today we're doing a review of Star Trek The Next Generation Season 2, Episode 4, The Outrageous Okana, story by Len Mention, Lance Dixon, David Landsberg, and teleplay by Burton Armis. Interesting name there, directed Jeez. by Robert Becker. This was December 12th, 1988. Where were you? Hello, Sirach Lofton. What's up? Jeez, that's a lot. That was a lot of writers on that one. I uh, know. What, You'd Lance think that mentioned? this episode would reflect that. <laughs> 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 or maybe it does. Yeah. Uh, I don't know. Maybe they took the story from somewhere else, one of those things, and I'm not sure. Written by, teleplay by. Okay, it can't be a coincidence that this guy's last name is Armis, though. That was the creature that killed Tasha Yar. <clears throat> I was thinking the same thing. Yeah, like Bolians were named after uh, director Cliff Bowl. Maybe Armis was named after Burton Armis. And uh, Nagilam was named after whoever it was, Mulligan, if you remember that right. uh, anecdote. Right. Right. Anyway. <laughs> this uh, next generation is just full of little hidden clues. Yeah. Well, and uh, Picard has a, a lionfish. Is it a lionfish? In his ready room that's named after David Livingston. It's called Livingston, his fish. <laughs> I did not know that. Yeah, I think it's a... Picard's fish is David Livingston. Yeah, it is. Uh, I think it's a lion fish or something like that. Some angry looking fish. Um, right now, people are like yelling at the screen of what it is. Anyway, what do you think <laughs> of this episode while I look this up? Oh, yeah, it is a lion fish. Okay. Okay. That lion ass fish. Tell the <laughs> truth. <laughs> oh, and speaking of fish, Data thinks that fish are amphibians. Did you notice that? He says no. there was a line about when he was talking to the comic. By the way, there were some uh, pretty interesting guest stars in here. I don't know if you noticed that. I noticed one. Who is that? I thought it was Terry Hatcher was in this episode. Was it? Yes, yes, it was her. Yeah, I love Terry. I love me some Terry Hatcher. She is gorgeous. Me too. When I was a kid, uh, she was housewife. She was at the top of the top for me as a kid. I thought found her to be very charming. Yes, I really think she's beautiful. Um and this was a young, I was super surprised to see her in this role because before they actually gave her more screen time and they just kind of flash fire in the beginning, I was like, man, that transporter chief is hot. I know. Need <laughs> and then you look more closely and you're like, wait a minute, is that Terry Hatcher? <laughs> yeah, that's exactly what I had to rewind it, you know? And I was like, that's Terry Hatcher because her she wears a different hairstyle later on but this yeah. is the long curly hair kind of uh almost like marina Sirtis's hair in, in the, the first season similar but the mm. big hair the big curly hair and i was like man she is so hot and then when the guy proceeds to talk to her and and i was like oh, okay she's not just some background super hot actress that was just in the background she's actually got lines in this episode and they gonna feature her um and then I was like, hey, I'll, I'll trade her for uh, O'Brien. O'Brien, you can do something else, man. You don't need to be doing well, this. What did I do? He says. Yeah. <laughs> well, well, how should I know? <laughs> the warp core needs some maintenance. You can do yeah. all the, uh, the pipeline yeah. stuff. We Go roll up your sleeves and conduit. fix something. <laughs> hey, uh, here's a quick story about Terry Hatcher. 
quick story. Okay. So I was definitely in love with her when I was a, a young fella. And then several years ago, I was working in a high-end restaurant in Westwood, California. Strock knows it well. Uh, that's where UCLA is in Westwood. And uh, one day, Terry Hatcher walks in. And she is with Baron Frickin' Davis. Okay. Mm. UCLA alum, Golden State Warriors alum, of course, among other teams. And uh, this was while he was on the Warriors. This was in the summer, so it was the off season. And uh, I bring them into the back room so they can be alone. And I'm like, it's freaking Baron Davis. I was like so excited, you know. And uh, anyway, the point is, she, you know, I, I kind of talk to them or whatever, and and I. I give some kind of insider knowledge on like warriors trade dealings or something. And he kind of looked at me like, how do you know that kind of stuff? But it's because I'm a big sports nerd. And if you listen enough, you can hear stuff. And uh, she goes off to the bathroom and he calls me over and he starts like just talking to me, you know, and he and I are kind of going back and forth about this inside kind of stuff. I'm, you know, listening in pretty intently. I think it was like July. And yeah, yeah. because I was it, July 8th was when some trade could go through. So it was before that. Anyway, so she comes back out of the bathroom and I kind of was like, you know, I, I kind of wanted her to leave us the fuck alone. I was kind of like, can you, <laughs> can you? And then, and I was saying, he's like, how do you know this? I'm like, oh, I'm from the Bay area, you know? And then she's like, I'm from the Bay area too. I'm from, I think it was Campbell or Los Gatos or adjacent. I think it was Los Gatos. And I'm like, oh, cool. And I turned right back to Baron. I was like, so anyway, Baron, <laughs> and I'm talking to him. And then as I'm walking away, I realize I'm like, man, 15 year old Ryan would have kicked my <laughs> ass that this girl is being so nice. And I'm like, okay, 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 okay thank you. But I, I'm talking to Boom Dizzle right now, please. I'm talking to <laughs> Boom. Me and BD you. are talking to basketball. Yeah. You just don't yeah. mind if you get us another five, another, 10 minutes. We'll be Have another soon. Pellegrino. I'm just <laughs> in Boom. <laughs> Anyway, so that was my yeah, painful day. Uh, probably made the wrong choice there. You probably <laughs> made the wrong choice. <laughs> but Baron made the right choice. Yeah, Baron Baron made the right choice. Um, I too, you know, had that same kind of crush on her, and uh, you know, there were others in that time period that were like childhood crush times. Mm -hmm. You know, that's when you have those childhood crushes. But the point she is, was she was exceedingly nice and friendly and i hope i didn't come off as rude or anything but i was just like star stricken by baron davis but she was very nice and very friendly and she seems like a wonderful person and she nailed this role which may have been one of her very first ever i would <laughs> she, she nailed this guy <laughs> <laughs> I thought that's what gonna say. <laughs> what's up with this guy uh... <laughs> why, why was everybody uh... falling under his spell so easily it didn't work it's the ponytail it's the ponytail oh. You need to grow out a ponytail. That's the key. It's they have like a rogue kind of braveheartish ponytail, leathers on. You know, I, I don't know. I can't tell you, but I can tell you, I was really happy right off the top to see how jealous Riker was. <laughs> that was the that was the highlight of the opening scene for me was just seeing Riker sing. I can tell you one thing, nothing wrong with his eyes. <laughs> he's, got, he's got great eyesight. <laughs> like, okay, thanks for the uh, the observation. I guess he beat you to uh, talking to the transporter chief because you were far, probably had your eye on her too. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> what else did he say about him? He says, uh, yeah, he mentions his eyesight and something else. But, oh, he has excellent vision. And a healthy libido, yeah, healthy to Riker. Libido. Yeah, <laughs> and so, but that's a healthy libido, according to Riker. Uh, to me, that's like a that's that's a toxic level of libido, bro. You can't even walk on the ship and just like he was say flirting, hi to somebody. He was flirting with Wesley <laughs> Crusher, even <laughs> yeah, like he was just like, I want everybody to love me. I don't care if I'm going to have sex with them or not, I just want everybody to look. And how was he humping three people already in one hour? What's going I thought, because yeah. I didn't remember how this ended. I thought he was going to have some kind of magic pheromone or something that made everybody 
like him. But no, he's just so freaking charming that he says two words and everybody just melts and says, all right, we can hump in 40 minutes. I'll be right back. And they're just like, yeah, How did, what's going on no, here? That was, no, it was too, it was over the top. That part was over the top. That That's again, indicative of the kind of stereotypical situation that a chauvinistic man would like to see himself in. Like, yeah, I just walk into a situation and, I get three girls the same day I was there. You know, it's like, yeah, all right. Sure, yeah, I just, everybody just follow. I just yeah. pay a couple compliments. Yeah, that, yeah, it's still not, that's not, no. I don't know. And, the, anyway. and, and, and the worst part is Riker's calling it a healthy libido. Like, yeah, that's what I, that, that's what I strive for. That's why yeah. I take these pills. Extras in 5,000. Like, <laughs> you know, like when, when you watch those commercials with the athletes and they're like, it's great for your libido. Your woman will like it too. Frank Thomas, uh, the big Frank hurt, Thomas. right? Yeah, the, the big, big flirt. <laughs> <laughs> so to me, it's like if Riker's like that's a, that's healthy libido over there. No, that's like toxic levels. That's, dude, calm down, man. We're, we just got on board the ship. You were floating adrift to your peril or something. Yeah, and, and why are they we're tolerating? Saving- <laughs> why are they tolerating? Why don't they just say, "Hey, calm down. You're coming with us." But they just sit there and watch him flirt. They're like, "Oh, look." <laughs> There he goes. And at no point they were like, okay, that's that's enough, please. That's our transporter chief. We treat yeah. her and everybody with a level of respect. Yeah. If you'd like to talk with her, maybe she'll be in 10 forward later, but for now. Yeah. But they just she's, sat she's there on and duty. watched. There, there'll be a time for that. Uh, but can you follow us? Because we, so, we have to debrief you on what's going on. I mean, so, something, it was terrible uh, for me because – and then he's in the bed with her in like the next scene. And I'm like, barf. <laughs> this guy. <laughs> yeah. You know, but when Data was emulating that comic, I was thinking, good thing he's not watching this guy and emulating this guy. Like, because he does oh, yeah. that. He'll watch somebody and learn from them. But I did want to mention he did uh, the fish thing that I was saying earlier. The one yeah. guy who, by the way, was a famous comic as well, Joe Piscopo. I didn't recognize oh, it, but Joe I looked, Piscopo. but I looked it up and I was like, oh, I know that name. I recognize Joe Piscopo that, because I was like, this has got to be some famous guy because he's doing his Jerry Lewis impression. But yeah, he mentioned, you know, something about an address. Then he says uh, a briefcase this, in the shape of a fish. Right. And then Data says, ah, so the juxtaposition of gender and an amphibian briefcase are funny. So Data thinks fish are amphibians because when the guy said mm. a fish briefcase, he replied with an amphibian briefcase. Somebody correct me. Like I'm not the best scientist in the world, but fish are not amphibians. They're fish. Hmm. Hmm. Yes. Um... <laughs> Data needs to know this. Like he should look it up in his head. Yeah. I thought he had a whole database. But clearly, uh, <laughs> there was actually one line in this episode that, that referred to that I thought was funny. He says, uh, have you seen uh, have you seen any good looking computers lately? <laughs> that, <laughs> that was the line that he gave to Data when he was you know, trying to ask if he had ever made love to somebody. I think it was. That, that was actually a good point, too. He says, have you ever made love to somebody? And Data's response was the act or the emotion. Mm. Uh, and I thought that was like a great point to bring up, you know, because this guy obviously doesn't really know the difference between the two. Yeah, he said they're one and the same. I'm like, yeah, yeah. I, uh, I, <laughs> that big I don't know how people <laughs> keep falling for you because these lines are not they're not working, man. I don't see it. <laughs> <laughs> that's what i'm saying even though even the girl that uh, even terry hatcher character said to him when he first kind of came on to him he's like yeah you probably say that to all the girls you know like she wasn't impressed and then he's like yeah but it's the way i say it in the conviction and and all this other stuff and it's like that works because I, I i guess i'm doing it totally well Barf. but I hope she got paid well because, you know, she came home and her husband or whomever was like, how is work today? And she's like, dude, I had to just pretend <laughs> some lech was hot all day. It was tiring, but I got a good paycheck for it. All right, cool. 
fine. Well done. Yeah. Yeah, he, he kind of rubbed me. He was just too much. He was over the top. And actually, uh, one of the things, because there's several things that upset me about it. Number one, as great as the wardrobe looks right here in this particular, yeah, it looked it looked too Robin Hood to me. I, I felt like, you know. You know, Robin the Hood, uh, everybody knows the uh, Sublime album, Robin the Hood. You know, it reminded me of Ice Pirates. You ever see that old '80s movie okay. Ice Pirates? That's what. No, it was. but I can when, I can see you on the pirate kind of look. Yeah, uh, and he was in this character reprised by the same actor in Prodigy. If you remember, there were a couple episodes that they they hired the oh, actor, yeah. he, but he had oh, an yeah. eye patch, and, and then I he liked like jumps off. Prodigy up. though. Yeah, it's same guy. Liked him better in Prodigy. Now you know where it came from, and that it's such a bummer when you see these characters now on the new shows, but you haven't seen these old ones yet. You're just kind of seeing them in reverse order, but now you can appreciate who they were reprising. This guy. Oh, I totally remember his character in Prodigy. I mean, it was a standout performance because of the role being just almost as obnoxious, <laughs> but it seemed to work better in animation than it does in real in real life because I, I was not convinced that he had the charm that they were trying to tell me that he had. It didn't seem to come mm -hmm. across for me. I think, and if I remember correctly, wait, let me pull him up uh, in, in as, his, as his prodigy character. Okay. Check this out. Which he plays the same thing, like he the same exact character, right? A merchant yeah. ship captain. Yeah, but he's gotten old and yeah, yeah, I remember that, that character. Now, uh, the other fun thing is, uh, and his name was Thaddean Okana. I always want to call it Okona because of how it's spelled. Right, me too. He was too. also in not so using the two episodes of prodigy but he was also in lower decks and i'm pulling that up right now as well so the same guy same character in prodigy and lower decks so there's to my knowledge there's only been one character ever that's been in prodigy and lower decks and it's this guy originated in the next generation so this was him in lower decks oh yeah wow yeah, and this is him. And so Lower Decks takes place basically like kind of right after Next Generation ends. So you see he's younger there, but he's got the eye patch. And then later on, so the people from Lower Decks and Prodigy obviously spoke and connect because, you know, 15 years later in the, the Prodigy yeah. era, he still got that eye patch. And that eye patch is not consistent with the Next Generation. So clearly wow. Prodigy and Lower Decks are talking with each other because it's consistent between the two of them. Wow. Pretty cool. And so he did the voiceover work for both? Yeah. Wow. I bet he never thought he'd be working 25, 35 years later on the same show just off, based on that character. But that's Star Trek. You know, um, I'm just checking to confirm that he did the voice i mean i just assumed it was him because it sounded like him he did the voice in both episodes of prodigy but i don't see it in lower decks i'm not sure okay. why everybody in the live chat and in the comments below let us know why he's not was it because he didn't have any lines in lower decks maybe it's because he didn't have any lines okay i don't remember let us know in the comments below please I'm sure they still gave him a check for reprising his character, though. Um, you would not think that this character would be something that you would recall and bring back. Uh, <laughs> but he wasn't <laughs> just because it, the, the story, I guess, was more lackluster than the character. I felt like the character was OK. He could have been really good. They just didn't give him enough to do. They just made him uh, to easy to figure out and mm. it wasn't dynamic at all. It was just very, you know, it was just 
remedial, in my opinion. There was no depth there. The only mystery was that he actually didn't sleep with somebody. And I think the, the moral of the story came at, at some point towards the end when he says, see how a man gets a reputation. Um, to me, that was like the whole story was based around that principle that a man gets a reputation even though it could be based on falsities, on lies, mm -hmm. or some or misunderstandings, right? So we assume that he was the father of the kid because he's sleeping with everybody else. So yeah, right. And so that would be, I guess, the lesson is like you know, never judge a book by its cover. But is he really not like the book that we really think? Yeah, he this is, is more he... like don't judge <laughs> chapter twelve by the first eleven chapters. We just <laughs> saw you doing all this home. Like seriously, it's not like you got not three the kids here, on guy. the ship now. Yeah, he just, yeah. I think He's he impregnated like, three women on this ship. <laughs> see how unfairly they they targeted me for their judgment. <laughs> no. Well, Come on, man. So this is the there one is time you didn't do it, okay? <laughs> Congratulations. Yeah, you've got three people pregnant on the Enterprise just <laughs> since you've been here. Yeah. <laughs> Seriously. I I don't understand why, you know, we're not that far off. Okay, we were off by this one a little bit. Okay. But, you know, we weren't that far off. You know, that just makes me think that's a good point, though, Srock. It just makes me think of what would have given this a little bit more depth is if there were somebody on the ship, let's say like, I mean, they kind of touched on it. Let's say Riker was super against this guy and was saying, you know, and, and Picard was saying, well, you know, we don't know what happened. We can't, just, you know, and then Riker was saying, no, I know he did it. It's so obvious. I keep catching him in other quarters. And so then Riker or that person would have learned that lesson and we can learn it through him of like, don't take it too far. But instead, you just kind of have Worf ambiguously growling at him and saying, I would love to. And you're like, Are, do you mean fighting or? <laughs> <laughs> because it looked like the guy, the guy uh... walks right up to him and like breathes in his face and they look eye to eye. And, and, <laughs> and we know how Klingons are. And, you know, he growls he's like, Rrr. I would love to. And I'm like, uh, <laughs> okay. I, I don't know if you're being menacing here, but it's not working. It sounds like you're reciprocating. <laughs> and then the guy, and then the uh, O'Connor says perhaps another time or something. Like, <laughs> yeah. I'll with a wink later. and a slap on the ass. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, what's going on here? Am got a I towel. missing something? He's hitting, whipping him with the towel. <laughs> yeah. O'Connor's like you said, he came on to everybody. Wesley, mm -hmm. I was like, seriously, man, leave Wesley alone. Man. He's just, you know, he just got here. His mom's not here to kick your ass. And if she was, you'd probably yeah. be trying to sleep with her too. You mm -hmm. know? Which reminds me, there was no Pulaski today. Uh but yeah. you know what? Let's uh hop to our very quick break right now because there was a moment that I thought of you in this one. It wasn't that moment we just mentioned. <laughs> but uh, we will uh, discuss all of that and come right back. Where was Pulaski on the seventh rule? Hello, everybody. Welcome back to the seventh rule with Ciroc freaking Lofton. We were just talking about on the break how great this episode was. Uh, here are the trivioids of the week. The Enterprise is traveling in the Omega Sagitta system, traversing between the twin planets. The Enterprise meets a mischievous, irreverent, and somewhat brazen dude. Apparently, wild elephant is another term for rogue. That was weird when Data was naming all those things. Uh, Lois Lane plays the transporter chief. That's uh, Terry Hatcher. Yeah, Lois Lane. Okana believes the act of love and emotion of love are the same thing. Guinan insists her joke was funny. The 23rd century's Stano Riga is the funniest performer ever. Uh, word that, oh, words that end with K are funny, or a briefcase, the shape of a fish. Data thinks fish are amphibians. Data attempts to be an easy room. Joe Piscopo has problems removing his fake teeth. A globfly yeah. is similar to a mosquito, and the jewel of Thessia is a national heritage. Did you notice how he was? When Data yeah. pulls out his teeth and then the comic guy was, I was like, what is going on? What's happening here? Yeah. A second take. I thought that was um, 
<clears throat> it took him a while because it seemed like he was trying to get some other stuff off. But I didn't know what it was, but it was like he had more than one piece. Data seemed to get his out in one in one swoop. It seemed like he had like three pieces. Like he was like yeah. one, two. <laughs> but he acted but, uh, it well. Like it didn't seem like it yeah. distract. I watched it two or three times. It didn't look like it distracted him. So he was a pro. Like sometimes the blocking doesn't work and it shows on the actor's face. You know, like yeah. it, you can kind of, they're still going doing the lines, but he seemed to just be like, it didn't distract him one bit. Absolutely. No. And, 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 and to me, that was really, I guess the highlight or the, the best part of the episode was data and his search for comedy, which we, you know, we've talked about it before. Brent Sp Spiner is just an incredible comedic actor when he wants to be um he's so good at just delivering the the straight funny line not the kind of hammy funny line that he was trying to do in this episode where he was you know with the cigar and let me tell you about some guys and you know <laughs> that's not data's uh strong suit or brent's strong suit for comedy it's more of the uh you know, straightforward, uh, emotionless kind of delivery where he doesn't, where he's almost trying not to be funny, yeah. you know? Uh, like at the end when he does the goodbye data, just something simple like that, you know? That was more funny than all of the jokes he was trying to tell. Yeah. Uh, um, oh, and which reminds me of... This I had remembered that scene, but I did not remember what episode it was in. It was a very memorable scene for me. It was the most memorable scene of the episode is when Data realizes the audience is just laughing at everything he's doing and he's not actually being funny. So at first he thinks, oh, wow, I'm killing it. And you all you can almost see him getting sad. You can feel for Data when he says computer turn the audience off or something to that. And they started laughing when he said that. <laughs> yeah, they did. They're like, oh, good boy. Oh, that's fun. my favorite joke. <laughs> but it was like, I, I remember being, uh, as a kid, when I saw this, I remember being emotionally affected by that moment, that realization. I felt like, I, I just felt like that was a good moment. To me, that was probably the best moment. What I didn't remember, though, was Guinan's good moments with him in 10 forward because she's a little bit when Troy is counseling somebody she's very mindful of their feelings she says things in the nicest way possible she works with them Guinan when she's count giving somebody counsel she's being blunt he says was that not funny and she goes no she does Troy would be like, well, you know, humor is subjective and some people find yeah. things funny and other Guinan's like, no. And then she's like, you're never going to be funny. You're not funny. My joke was funny. And she's like, very yeah. good. And she was right. Her joke was funny. <laughs> it, it was. And, and, and I love that scene between the two of them it was probably the best scene in this episode when she, when he says, you, you know, she she says, and I'm annoyed, right? And he went into, she explained her joke to him. And then he says, you told the joke. And she's like, yeah, yeah. And he says, I'm not laughing. And she's <laughs> like, yes, yes. <laughs> that was the funniest scene when he, right. when, when he says, I'm not laughing. And she's like, yes, yes. And he's like, maybe it wasn't funny. And she's like, no, no. My joke's funny. <laughs> now the joke was funny. The problem is you, bro. So sorry to that tell you. That was the best scene. That was the best scene. That little interaction mm -hmm. with Whoopi. I wrote down in my notes, Whoopi is back. Yes. Because she does bring something uh, to the table that nobody else does. There's a thing that Whoopi does. There's an energy that she brings. And it's unique to her and her personality and her skills as an actor. Mm -hmm. actor. So... I really love seeing her back on the screen and that scene with data and the two of them was just, that was classic. Mm -hmm. uh, great delivery on data's part, especially when he says, I'm not laughing. I love that part. <laughs> you know, it reminds me a scene that you are going to see is when, you know, somewhere down the line, I don't even remember what episode it is, 
but he tries a beverage and I believe it's Guinan that has him try it. And I don't know, remember if it was prune juice or what, but she says, here, try this. But was it, you know, it might not have even been an episode. It might've been a movie. I really don't remember, but it's such a classic scene. He tastes it. And then she goes, what do you think? And he goes, it's revolting. <laughs> and then she goes, would you like some more? He goes, please and he's like so excited to like learn what revolting yeah. tastes like uh and people in the comments below right now i know they're all just yelling out what episode that is but please yeah. let us know go ahead and use all caps if you want put on that caps lock and yell at me about it but that's such a memorable moment uh when i thought of you Sirach, was when we had our Mari Povich moment of you are not the father. And then, and I was like, I bet yeah. you right now, Sorok's thinking like, this is like Mari Povich with this, this whole yeah. twist around. I don't know. Did that jump out at you yeah. at all? Um, at some point I knew that that was what was going on just based hmm. on the, the language and the conversation. Uh, yeah, at some point when they were all gathered in that room, and I knew that he was not, there was something more to the story. It seemed like the boy wasn't talking, he wasn't talking, and then the, the girl who was pregnant wasn't talking. And I don't know anybody who would be more upset than the woman who's actually pregnant, so she would have more to say than I think anybody in the room. Yeah. Uh, and it seemed to me that that was awkward. So once that happened, I was like, okay, something's going on. How come she's not talking? Because she would be the one like, you know, you never answered my calls and this and that. It would be more there mm -hmm. than just the father. Well, <laughs> thank goodness we had Deanna Troy in that scene when everybody comes out, tells the truth, and they all admit the truth. And she leans in and she goes, now we're hearing the truth. I'm like, oh, yeah. this poor lady. <laughs> Why are they giving her this line? She's got to be so embarrassed. But she's like, seriously, you guys, yeah. after we yeah. all know that everybody confessed and told the truth and everybody agrees, that's when I got to pipe in and say, now we know that I, Picard would like look at her like, <laughs> what, what am I supposed to say to that? We know, dude. Yeah. No, uh, I think it was Eve England called her Captain Obvious. Yes. That, that's that's what she is. She, She's the most Captain Obvious person ever. Like, seriously, mm -hmm. we, we got it. Yeah, we know. Mm -hmm. uh, thanks for that. Um, and that, you know, that's just indicative of kind of poor writing for her character. There could be a lot more stuff done than what was face value. I sense that he's horny, Captain. Yeah, because <laughs> he's grabbing her ass. You know? Yeah. Like, <laughs> he's jumping can... warp. He's jumping <laughs> yeah. west. The way he was holding his machine too was a little sensual. <laughs> it was crazy. His machine. Yeah. He was holding his machine the whole episode is the problem. Yeah. Um, They're like, why is this but... machine so worn out? Don't worry about that. Just fix it. <laughs> but yeah, there was just, it was just a little bit too much. You know what he reminded me of though is I don't know if anybody's ever seen princess bride. Yes. But the main guy in Princess Bride who saved, who's trying to save the princess, you mm -hmm. know, uh, who our good friend, the Grand Negus, is in. Uh, right. You know, Wesley um, but, was his name. The character was Wesley, yes. played yes. by, yeah, uh, Wesley by and who? Buttercup. And of course, you're right, Buttercup. Wallace Shawn, the Sicilian. Yes. Yes. And that's ex And of course, Fred Savage, as we know, and Mandy Patinkin. Patinkin, I think it is, uh, who I did not realize. Uh, I saw him in Homeland and a bunch of other things. This really amazing freaking actor. I didn't realize until recently that was the same guy as the Inigo Montoyo guy. Uh, you killed my uh -huh. father, prepare to die. Yeah. I'm like, yeah. oh, is that the same actor? Brilliant. Anyway. Yes, that's exactly what I thought of uh, Wesley from The Princess Bride. Um. It almost seemed like there was a point where O'Connor was going to come on to Troy. And I don't think he did, right? And it was weird that that, that happened. Like, uh, what's wrong with her? You know, like, it seems like anybody walking, he's, he's shooting that. So I didn't understand why, why he didn't attack Troy. You know what I mean? It felt weird. 
yeah. that he wouldn't come on to her. It seemed like uh, that's what they were setting up at the beginning. Yeah, when he, he said, was, is that a woman's voice? Yeah, yeah, and she was smiling and being friendly and liking his charm and all. It seemed like that's what they were setting up, but I guess they were just setting up that everybody likes this guy. He just charms the pants off of her buddy. Yeah. Um, not my favorite, though, but I would have liked to have seen this story go differently in a whole lot of different directions. I think there was opportunity there to make Riker uh, more of a center figure to kind of like be suspicious of this guy or more of a competition there, you know, because Riker's supposedly the, you know, I'm the smooth talker charmer. I get yep. to, you know, what I thought was weird was when uh, Picard's like, you can commission rape with any one of my, fl-. like, he's like, basically you can bang out any one of my crew. And I'm like, what? kind of things that, oh like, what kind of that was a yeah. weird offer out that they put out there that was another thing that i found was really strange along those lines and it was when they found out that the guy was that the one dad was mad that he that okana impregnated her his daughter and then just ran off and they were oh yeah and so you know, Picard and Troy were laughing at this dad going like, he's like, what's his problem? And she's like, oh, it's, you know, dealing with ancient codes and this and that. And they're like, I'm like, wait, what's so ancient codes about a dad (laughs) being pissed off that some dude humped his daughter and ran off without, you know, given anything got, you know, got her pregnant without, without any kind of I, I don't know, so moral support or compensation responsibility. or, or conversation. Responsibility. And they're calling mm-hmm. it ancient. Oh, this guy wants someone to take care of his wife's or his daughter's child. What an ancient coat. I just didn't understand that thing. Maybe I missed it. Maybe they meant something else. But I was like, is Roddenberry right in this? I don't know. What's going on? <laughs> yeah, yeah. That I felt the same way about that. Um, like, I don't understand what's so archaic about responsibility you know, somebody, <laughs> taking responsibility for a life that you bring into this world is that something that's going to change in the future like where you can just you know have no accountability whatsoever mm-hmm. i think that's i think that was kind of a and then the other thing was i thought picard saying no i don't care who you have sex with on my uh, you can you can i was like well you should <laughs> a little bit i mean what's going on here this guy can walk me in the door and just we don't know anything you know. about this guy. Maybe he puts a spell on people. Maybe he gives them a disease. Like we yeah. should be, yeah, you should careful be about this stuff. Something, yeah, yeah. yeah. What, what? Yes, some kind of suspicion. We don't know if he has a spell. We don't know. We, we've run into a thousand different kind of alien powers that people have, electricity and all those other kind anything. of stuff. Yeah, the guys that were zapping people. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Hey, so it could be a mind control thing that he has. I mean, I would anything. think that you would want to investigate a little bit about it. <laughs> so uh, it has come time to uh, do our home run of the episode. Everybody here. Uh, what do you think, Sirach? Who gets the home run of the who scored? <laughs> who got the home? <laughs> yeah, we shouldn't talk about yeah. baseball analogies in this episode. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> well, we already know who had the most home runs in this <laughs> yeah. episode. Uh, but I, I, I'm just, I wasn't blown away by his character that much. Um, so it's going to be hard for me in this one. I, I'm going to give it to Brent Spiner. Uh, I'm giving the home run to Brent Spiner as data. I thought the lines, one of my favorite lines, if not my fa- favorite line, is when he says, my timing is digital. Yeah. I just thought, I thought, boom, that's, that's a good joke. That's a great delivery. <laughs> you, and you delivered it like a robot. I mean, it's just, that's, that's high level comedy for Brent. And, mm. you know, doing the whole, you know, a monk, a, a clone and a Ferengi walking to a bar, you know, <clears throat> that's, that's a basic level comedy. But Brent has like this, 4d chess level of comedy where he's able to play it as a android you know what i mean as a yeah. computer trying to trying to be human uh but delivering these lines as if he doesn't know what these things are you know uh 
um, even when he gives computer definitions for words. Uh, you know, just all of the way he delivers his comedy is is high level, um, in my opinion, because you have to do it in a way as if you don't know things, but you're a computer who has no emotions. And so he's he gets an A plus for that in this this episode. Yeah, uh, my home run of the day. I mean, we already know who got yeah, who who scored and got to second base and third and all that stuff. But uh, for me, it's slightly different, almost the same as you. For me, the home run of the day focuses more on data, the character than the actor. And I just just because I feel like that was a it, it was the, the moment was was also data's the character. And that's that's kudos to the writing there when he has that moment of realization that the audience was just programmed to laugh or whatever. And that's part of his that character's growth is just, you know, he's just learning bit by bit by bit. And we're growing with him. We're watching him strive to be something. And then sometimes he succeeds, sometimes he fails, but he's always learning. And he's kind of learning with the uh, the wonder of a child a lot of times. You know, we're watching. That's Brent Spiner doing that, that you know, the acting there. Uh, so that's who gets it for me. Uh, look, let's give a very special thanks to some people who hit home runs and grand slams for us every single time. Their names are Homer Frizzell, Dr. Anne-Marie Siegel, Eve England out in Wales, Yvette Blackman, Tom, TJ Jackson Bay out in Missouri, Bill Victor Arukin. Arukin. Uh, uh, who we're going to miss. He's not going to be in Star Trek Las Vegas this year. We'll miss you, Bill, next time, hopefully. Uh, our good pal Titus Muller, Darlena Marie, Dr. Muhammad Noor, Tierney C. Diekman, Anna Post, Anil O. Palat, Joe Balserati, Mike Gu, DQ, Neil Akasaka, Akasaka. Uh, Justine Norton Kurtzen, Dr. Stephanie Baker, Carrie Schwent, Faith Howell, Edward Foltz, my live from Tokyo, the Matt Boardman, Chris McGee, Justin Weir, Jake Barrett, Jane Jorgensen, Henry Unger, Allison Leach Hyde, Julie Manisfi, Marsha Classic Schreier, and of course, <laughs> Dr. Susan V. Gruner and Jason Oaken. All right, everybody, stick around. We've got the free for all up next. You've been waiting this whole time for the free for all. It's here. We'll be right back on <laughs> the seventh rule. Hi, everybody. Welcome back to the seventh rule with Ciroc freaking Lofton. Hello, hello. This is the free for all, everybody. And uh, we are joined with our good friends, Melissa Longo. Hi. <laughs> my live in Tokyo, Carrie Schwent, the magnificent McGee, TJ Jackson Bay out in Missouri, Dr. Muhammad Noor with his hashtag save. Star Trek prodigy background, brilliant. <laughs> We've got Allison Leach Hyde, uh, Faith Howell wearing her Cardassian shirt, which is freaking brilliant. Uh, we've got Marsha Classic Schreier, the Matt Boardman, and of course, Jason Oaken, the outrageous Oaken. Uh, all right, <laughs> <laughs> here we go. Uh, nice. Oh. Of course, Jake Sisko guesses the IMDb score. Oh, this mm. was probably high up there in the low fives. <laughs> Read my mind. Uh, so I'm going to say I'm going to go a 5.7 because of Terry the Great Hatcher. Her height. <laughs> 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 Terry's height. No, I don't think so. Is, I, is she five seven? That's a little she's bit short. lowest, wouldn't you say? So I think she's a little bit low. Lowest, too yeah. high. Lowest. That's a yeah. little bit lowest. She was lowest. lowest. Yeah, it is a little lowest. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. <laughs> so does anybody I else have a guess? guess. I'm going seven five. Now. Wow. Oh, the opposite. Mirror universe. Yeah, I think this one should be higher, especially now that we've got Okana popping up different places. Oh, there may be some true. people peeking back and going, "Oh, yeah, all right, that he's pretty cool." 
Good point. Okay, seven five. Anybody else? Seven six. Ooh. All Ooh. right. All bets are in. Okay. Uh, it is actually a six point two. Six two. Yep. Six two. Close, Sirach. Uh yeah. a lot of wishful thinking yeah. here. Point five away. Yeah. Uh okay. We didn't have any non-appearance mentions, but we did have a non-appearance non-mention, right? For uh, Dr. Pulaski, right? Bummer. A non-appearance anyway. non-mention. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. <laughs> you know, we have we have those every episode with <laughs> <That's true. laughs> a lot of people. <laughs> everybody. Basically. Everybody. <laughs> Well, um, Melissa Longo, can you get us started on the right track, please? Oh, uh, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, I, what I learned from this episode is that um, Data is, a, is as skilled at telling jokes as I am. Um, <laughs> I, well, you know, that's funny. It, it, it's, <laughs> there are times when I'll tell a joke and, you know, <laughs> I'll get an explanation about how that's not accurate. <laughs> like, I know it's a joke. <laughs> There's no laughing, nothing. So, yeah. Um, <laughs> there are some funny lines in this. Um, and there are parts of it that worked for me. Um, the, the, I thought the, in the exchange between Riker and Picard when they're discussing surrendering to the ships <laughs> 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 because their lasers can't penetrate even their navigation. <laughs> that, that was funny to me. <laughs> um, and then some of, some of uh, Data's attempts at jokes were funny to me the the whole a um what was it the a ferengi a clone and something else walk into a bowling alley i thought that was pretty funny and then the he was trying to talk about the um person hired and tired to be shot out of a cannon and he was hired and fired on the same day. <laughs> that was funny. <laughs> that was funny. <laughs> I, um, and I'm, I'm on the fence on what to think of a Kona. I've never seen this episode before. Um, yeah, I, it was a first for me. And uh, I'm, I'm on the fence on what to make of him. I mean, he had some charming moments, and I like the actor a lot, uh, and I've seen him in a lot of stuff, but um, I don't know. And part of it could be personal biases, but other, I don't know. <laughs> he, he, I don't know. <laughs> and that's kind of how I felt about the episode overall. Uh, I don't know. <laughs> Did he remind you of the Ice Pirates at all? Remember the Ice yes. Pirates, that movie? Well, no, not that. But he did remind me of a pirate, Captain Jack Sparrow. Um, and <laughs> but <laughs> not as quirky. <laughs> and uh, but I it, it was interesting to read that he was the Billy Campbell was uh who Gene Roddenberry wanted to play Riker. Mm -hmm. Hmm. Which I not enough chest hair. Same height. Which, yeah, they're they're both really tall. Eric That's why he's giving him dirty looks. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, Eric Pierpoint was a runner up for that too, if I remember correctly. Oh wow! Um, of uh, mm -hmm. Alien Nation. Mm -hmm. Anyway, look, runner up to nobody is my live in Tokyo. What's up, my? What do you think of this one? I think we should retitle it The Outrageous Mullets. I mean, Okona, <laughs> Episcopo. Seriously? <laughs> um, yeah. 
There were a lot of mullets that we were dealing with on this episode. <laughs> Data's laugh, though, that dry, raspy laugh, love it. Mm. That always gets I me like every time. That. The the rendezvous with the red t-shirt dress clad transporter operator. Ah, that was that was ludicrous. But it, interesting, I thought it spoke to the the loneliness of of space military work and the necessity to be practical um, when the opportunity for libido workouts presents itself. And I thought that, mm -hmm. that was that was another way to look at that. Um, I really like Data's gentle touching of Guinan's arm as he left 10 forward when he was called to the bridge. I thought that was really sweet, very human, actually. I didn't didn't expect that. Don't ever think we've seen that again. That was, that was excellent. Um, a fun episode, a little too obvious. Uh, still, though, there were some there were some interactions, good character development, I thought, for a lot of the people. And I thought that it was something that we desperately needed at this point in the series. So I like that aspect of it. Um, one fun tid tidbit, Chris, is that um, the term Sagita, which is the name of the system where they are, means, among other things, an architecture keystone, which is what this is. Um, the key, keystone, the, it's, um, it comes from geometry. It's the distance between the center of an arc and the center of the base, and it's used to measure to calculate the size of the arch that's required to support whatever it's going to bear. And um, the uh, the keystone, is it's the thing which it locks the arch. The two sides of the arch are built, and then that's locked in, and then weight is pushed down, and that pushes the, 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 the stones on the sides, pressure down, and it allows it to bear weight. And I thought, um, in, in, a, in a big way, Okona acted as the keystone between the two sides of the arch that mm. were Benzan and Yanar allowing them to come together and be one. And I saw, I like the way they introduced the name of the system as Sagita at the beginning, and then had him play that role as a keystone for those two people. So that was kind of cool. Um, and I, I guess the only thing left to say is, say goodnight, Gracie. Goodnight, Gracie. Huh. <laughs> <laughs> Take my wharf, please. Uh, <laughs> look, <laughs> Dr. Noor is here, and thank goodness he is here. Uh, the Vice Provost for Academic Affairs at Duke University and occasional Star Trek Science Advisor. And the reason we need you here, uh, Dr. Noor, for the record, is a fish an amphibian, please? No. <laughs> easy answer on that one. <laughs> Thank you. That was easy. Uh, your yeah. thoughts on this episode? Sure. Because they, this... they did say, sorry, that Data did say that a fish was an amphibian in this episode. And yeah, that I'm confused the hell out of us. <laughs> it's okay. <laughs> I enjoyed seeing a coin again. That was show. before yeah. they hired Muhammad to be the science. Oh, guy. there you go. <laughs> yeah, there we go. That was, that was the old guy. <laughs> <laughs> I appreciate the vote of confidence. Uh, I enjoyed seeing a coin again after seeing him, obviously, in Lower Decks and, and in Aaron Prodigy, as we have over here. And again, hashtag Safe Star Trek Prodigy. Um, there were two things I just thought were uh, things I wanted to comment on. One of them was, <laughs> this is minor, but I really enjoyed it, that amusingly dramatic and ominous music as Worf was walking down the hall to get Ocona. Yes. It, was, it was so over the top, like, what's about to happen? And this connects with uh, some of the stuff that has been said earlier. The, um, the humor aspects felt a little dated to me relative to what's happening, obviously, right now in terms of AI and things like that. So I wanted to test this and inspired a little bit by Carrie here. I asked Bard, which is the Google version of ChatGPT, to compose an original humorous lim lim limerick about data from Star Trek The Next Generation. Oh, That's wow. what I just typed in. And it composed one. I'll just read it to you. There once was an android so fair whose positronic brain was quite rare. He could solve any grim problem you threw at him, but he still couldn't tell a limerick from a square. So that was just based on, you know, just <laughs> typing in that one prompt. And it came up with it. And I tried Googling wow. sections of it, and it's not on the internet. It made up that limerick. It's right pretty, there. Uh, and pretty smart. It's not the best, but it's not bad. <laughs> so again, yeah, felt a little dated, bad. but yeah, but it felt a little dated. But then again, I mean, you know, it is almost 40 years ago, so it's fair. <laughs> so that was it. Yeah. Good stuff. Thank you very much for that. Uh, Don't worry, Carrie. We're not going to replace you. Yeah. <laughs> your job is definitely safe for now that's yes. all that showed <laughs> uh tj jackson bay is out in missouri and he it feels very strongly about that ominous music that was playing when Worf was just taking a, a stroll down <laughs> it the hall so dramatic so <laughs> yeah. dramatic uh and it's not i think the last time that we get a dramatic walk down the hall um yeah so that was fun um I also noticed that after that um, moment, uh, every time we saw Kana, if you notice in the background, 
there's a security escort with him after that. <laughs> so um, <laughs> Worf was not playing. He was he was on his game. He's like, okay, we called you. You didn't come. You're causing trouble. <laughs> I got to put somebody on you. Um, I enjoyed this episode uh, a lot. I liked both of the stories. Um, you know, I thought, you know, Okana is, you know, really walking the line. And, you know, since I kind of knew, you know, how it ended, I was a little bit more observant in this watch for the things he said before the reveal uh, and and how he, he didn't particularly lie to Captain Picard, but he also didn't reveal the secret. Um, so I, I thought that, you know, he really was trying to... <clears throat> you know, be as honorable as he could in that situation. And that, you know, kind of informed me a little bit of his character, which was was nice. Um, Devin, on the other hand, the, the father of the young lady, uh, made me cringe <laughs> in the way that he treated his daughter. Um, and, you know, I think, uh, you know, obviously, you know, Captain Picard even commented on it that it was, he said it was ancient morality and he described his behavior as arcane. Uh, I think, think those are accurate descriptions, but, you know, really it's, it's, <laughs> it's kind of not far off from, from things that I see in the everyday. Uh, so it's, it's cringe people. If, if you don't know, I'm telling you now that's cringe behavior. Don't do it to your kids. Um, <laughs> And Data, I think, uh, you know, my comment on, you know, how human Data is uh, when he uh, touched Ganon's arm, but I also felt a very human moment from Data when he felt the disappointment uh, of the fact that the holodeck crowd was programmed to laugh at his jokes. And um, it, it's just fun. I love the way that Brent chose to play Data you know, a character with no feelings, but with so much feeling. Um, <laughs> and, uh, you know, I just really, really appreciate the choices that Brent made over the years to, to make us feel data, uh, <laughs> even though he didn't have any feelings. Mm -hmm. uh, so, uh, and, and lastly, <laughs> the Enterprise is pretty invasive. I thought uh, when they first see Okana's ship, like they do the whole workup. They know what's wrong with this ship. They know that it's empty. They know that he runs his engines hard and and like all of this stuff. I'm like, does this guy not have a right to any privacy at all? <laughs> and a prize flies mm -hmm. around. And then, you know, later on when <laughs> the wharf drags him to the bridge, Picard accuses him of coming on board with false pretenses. When O'Connor gave no pretense at all, he was just flying along and the Enterprise swoops in on him. Like, he didn't call for help. He didn't ask yeah. them to come. He didn't lie to them. Um, so <laughs> I thought that was uh, that was interesting that they had this kind of prejudged conception of this man's character um and probably you know the audience too i, I mean we mm -hmm. we see the way he behaves he's you know going from <laughs> from quarter to quarter you know doing this thing and you know Worf has to drag him away and <laughs> and uh also funny moment uh the crewman that he was kissing in the quarters had to stand on her tippy toes in that <laughs> scene <laughs> you look at her feet so uh, all in all, this is an episode that that I really enjoy. And I actually, uh, the thought that I had is it's a shame that we don't get episodes like this anymore because you won't find this episode in, in a, you know, 10 or 13 uh, episode season. They're not going to make an episode like this because it's not going to fit yep. into the greater story. Uh, so I miss that. Um, and hope that we can get that kind of Star Trek again in some iteration. And in some ways we get that in Strange New Worlds, but uh, but I miss episodes like this. These are the episodes that, that uh, you know, hit home for me that I watched over and over again when there was no new Star Trek. So uh, good episode. I love it. 
it deserves more than a what was it six two six five you know whatever definitely more than a what did you give it yeah. five something <laughs> five, seven. I, I wasn't off that by that much i was half a point yeah you were close you were close five five seven <laughs> well to be fair he's predicting what the people on imdb gave it not I'm yeah. sure he'd give it a 10. And by he the way, give it a five. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> but thank you, TJ. Also, uh, also, I always laugh at Melissa's jokes. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you, TJ. <laughs> Somebody has to, I guess. <laughs> Let's test that out. Melissa, ask him if the reason Devin wanted Okona to marry his daughter was because he wanted a, a Devin heir. Oh God! <laughs> no. <laughs> no. Okay. Uh, thank you very much, TJ. Uh, the magnificent McGee is here to uh, write this ship. Thank you very much. How are you? Good luck with that. Yeah, I couldn't uh, resist having the uh, alliteration, just like the title of the episode here. So yeah, this is this one was uh, one that I'm sure I'm. Th- quite surprised that it got as high of a rating as it got not because i didn't like it i enjoyed all of them that i just figured that most of the internet would not uh because this is the episode where we learned that data can only be funny unintentionally mm-hmm. at least until maybe he gets an emotion chip or something <laughs> uh like melissa has already said the uh you know it establishes that lasers are vastly inferior to phasers uh, maybe that's the reason why originally uh gene roddenberry wanted to use phasers in the show rather than calling them lasers because all the other sci-fi shows uh, they're called them lasers and of course i'm assuming this is in reference to you know sci-fi lasers and not light application by application by stimulated emission of radiation um Mohammed and tj of course noted the epic action music I, there's nothing nothing more i can say there um i did like how when data was doing his stand-up routine he, he kind of referenced other comedians at the time like rodney dangerfield when he did that little little neck turn and the the golf swing which is bob hope i think you know mm-hmm. that was Good. that was a nice little uh, references yeah. there uh and of course i didn't really have many uh notes uh for this episode so Kind of cutting it short here. The uh, memorable quote that stuck with me is, "My timing is digital." <laughs> <laughs> very nice, excellent. Thank you very much, Chris McGee. We've got Carrie Schwent here. Uh, challenge accepted with the uh, limerick. She's ready to go. What's up? I'm doing doing good. I think I might as well start off with my limerick, and then I'll get, yeah. get to, to a few things. This this one. <laughs> comes from Okana's point point of view this time around. I'm called outrageous, but I'm just a man who tries to live life as best as I can. I've got away with ladies. People think that I'm shady, but what I love most is, of course, romance. Aww. I like, uh-huh. I like Okana. <laughs> Charm. Four days. Cute little guy. <laughs> Yeah. I kind of would have liked to seen his hair out of the ponytail maybe when he was kissing that that second one. Desperately hoping that it was not a mullet because I like long long <laughs> hair on guys, but I just no mullets are a no, mullets are a no go. I can barely tolerate Joe Piscopo's um, <laughs> cadets on the bridge. Moment momentary. Oh my gosh! What hey. are you doing? This is not. Do me and switch, <laughs> and then this is Jake. His oh, slightly uh, bigger brother. They need all the kisses. <laughs> oh my gosh, they're so cute. <laughs> <laughs> they, oh, bless you. Okay. <laughs> anyway, where was I? Oh yes. Mullets. Oh mullets. Yes. Yeah, Joe Piscopo's. I could. Take or leave. He's he's not really the kind of comic that really kind of does it does it for me. I, I enjoy his accent, but impressions his impressions were just a little bit painful. I enjoyed the reg, the regular jokes though, and yeah, I lo- loved loved the accent. So many good guest stars in here. We get got Terry Hatcher, who is one of the another uh, one of the many fabulous Lois Lanes. Okana, you got he's the Rocketeer. 
I love that movie. I haven't seen it in years, though. The um, the pregnant lassie. He was do um a doctor on the second season of Sequest, which if you've never seen that show, it was a fantastic show. It should have gone on for a lot longer, in in my opinion. In my opinion. Uh, oh yeah, and on the list, a couple blink and you miss it sort of sort of things I noticed on the list of comedians that Data's looking up. There are so many, but I know a couple of them. I saw Tracy Torme, David Livingston, Doug Drexler. Hmm. I thought it was the one he selected was Ronald D. Moore, but it's actually Ronald B. Moore, who is one of the apparently one of the visual effects artists. I did a little bit of a little bit of hmm. research. And in both of the bedrooms that O'Connor goes into, Terry Hatcher's and the and the other ones, if you look at the bed, it's got a long pillow going across the back, but no bedding. Not one blanket, no bedding whatsoever. He told him to take the sheets off. He likes it um, damn dirty. Yeah, but you don't, you don't <laughs> need that. It could have been tossed off in the corner or something. Straight to the mattress. <laughs> <laughs> and Okada, he had a great, couple of great interactions, I thought, with, with Wesley. Wesley's sort of yeah. fascinated by him, but at the same time, he, re he realizes that he couldn't live the Kind of like that Okana does, even though he's like, I don't want to be like does. you. Okana was like, You don't want to be like me? Seriously? Have you been watching this episode? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and Guinan and Data were so sweet. Those 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 couple of scenes. And I love I loved her joke. That, um, you're a droid and I'm annoyed. Mm -hmm. Wow. Definitely gives a gives a hint of her. Sort of stand stand up comedy sort of sort of back back her her background. Oh, kind of made an excellent one too with with data about asking him if he'd seen any good computers lately, any good looking yeah. computers lately. Yeah, oh, kind of makes me smile. I could have done without the whole Romeo and Juliet Mori Povich part of the episode at the end, but <laughs> see, told you, Sirak Mori Povich. <laughs> uh, yeah, he, 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 not, you know what? He Okana makes me smile too. The daddy, yeah. he's not the daddy. He's the baby daddy. He's yeah. not the baby daddy. <laughs> <laughs> well, thanks very much, Carrie Schwent, aka Crafty <clears throat> Bear. We've got Allison Leach Hyde, who's here. She's also annoyed. Annoyed. <laughs> True, I am annoyed. <laughs> So I like this episode, always have. It's cute. It's fun. I love getting slices of life. And I really like Picard in this episode. You know, he is, you can see he's a little frustrated, like this is what I'm dealing with today. All right, fine. I'm going to do it to the best of my ability. And I'm going to take, you know, the utmost care of what I do and everything I do. And I'm going to put it to this ship who has a rogue-esque character on it and we need to do this and then now he's everyone wants to arrest him for different reasons and let's find out why and it's because a girl's pregnant and something's missing okay this is not end of the galaxy type of situation <laughs> but i'm going to treat it with the respect these people deserve and i i enjoyed that and i too carrie really liked the bit where wesley saying like uh -oh. that he hasn't seen his family apparently since uh, nemesis so allison uh we got a little glitch there can you repeat that last sentence please oh that we haven't seen wesley since mm -hmm. since nemesis so he he did end up being a lot like okona and i i kind of made me sad during that scene i'm like oh yeah he did end up like that so you know, there's a lot of fun reliving 80s humor. So, okay. Joe Piscopo is probably the only actor who did not have to be DLP. He got to improv a lot of his lines. So that's fun. And yeah, because most, you know, as we all know, we hear it all the time. And Ciroc lived it. So that's fun. I love that he called 
uh, Data Lieutenant Commander of Mirth. I thought that should be his name forever <laughs> after that. <laughs> <laughs> and my favorite line was, there's no need for your phasers, Captain. I'm harmless and not yet quite ready for a mercy killing. That was my favorite line. Excellent. Thank you very much, Allison Leach Hyde. We've got the Cardassian herself, the Spoonhead, Faith Howell. What's up, Faith? <laughs> so, yeah, I really like this episode. And I honestly kind of surprised me because I know we've seen Okana in some of the newer um, things like Prodigy. And I had a hard time connecting with his character in Prodigy the first time I saw it because I was like, I don't really remember a lot about the character. So it was nice to go back and revisit. Um, but I got the feeling that if the Enterprise had not come upon him, aside from maybe fixing his ship, he would have been completely fine with all these people hunting hunting him. He could have solved it. He would have smoothed it all over. It all would have worked out in the end. Um, and I um, got a lot of um, Jack Crusher vibes from him. Like, I wonder if we ever get Legacy, which I'm still, I'm still on that train. Um, mm -hmm. If we ever get Legacy, I really wonder if we might see Jack Crusher kind of be that that character and doing the the weird off you know Starfleet stuff, but making it all work in the end. And so I I really like let's do it let's do it, <laughs> please and thank you. <laughs> Excellent. Legacy's going to happen. Mm -hmm. I'm waiting. As soon as mm -hmm. this strike is over, I'm I'm going to be. Excellent. Yeah. Well, thanks very much, Faith Howell. Gull Howell, we should say. Uh, Marsha Classic <laughs> Schreier is here. What's up, Marsha? How are you? Great background. What'd you think of this episode? Well, like many of the episodes of season two, I didn't like it. But um, I, I, let me preface this by saying that I watched Saturday Night Live from day one. I'm, old, I'm that old. Um, and I did not like Joe Piscopo on Saturday Night Live. So his presence in this episode didn't do anything for me. In fact, my favorite line of the entire episode was discontinue comic. So um, <laughs> wow. it says something. Yeah, I know that was harsh, right? Billy Campbell, on That's the other hand, I, I, I could watch Billy Campbell, you know, read a phone book. I think he's adorable. Um, I just, it was such, such a bad interpretation of Romeo and Juliet. So, you know, there was just so many things I didn't like about it. Um, Harry Hatcher's character flirting in front of Riker and Data and Worf. I mean, how unprofessional. On you know? duty, yeah. On duty, while on duty, yeah. I, yeah. I, I didn't get that. And it struck me as odd that there was no mention of lore having some emotion and how much better lore could have possibly told any of these jokes or, you know, uh, had a much better interpretation of jokes. Um, so that, that sort of surprised me, but there was very little continuity back in the, the first and second season in terms of the writing. Um, so maybe not so surprising. Um, and another thing that surprised me is why is Worf, in addition to being the head of security, he's also the communications officer and he's also the weapons officer. Like communication seems to have been downgraded from the original series to next gen. Um, it was such an important role in Enterprise and the original series and it's not anymore it's like hailing frequencies open just give it to Worf why is he doing that so they don't have to pay another actor to say uh open frequencies are open or whatever the line is um and um libido workouts is now one of my favorite lines and I'm going to see all that I've yeah. never heard that before it's so funny thank you Mai. <laughs> thank you <laughs> Excellent. Great stuff. Thank you very much. Marsha Classic. We've got uh, Mr. Matt Boardman here. 
with his stand-up comedy background. What's up, Matt? What'd you think of this one? Cool shirt. Um, this one's uh I like this one. It's it's fun. It uh I don't know why, but as I'm watching, I was like, man, this episode feels very 80s to me. Maybe it's the it's the Ron Jones synth uh, uh, music. I mean, I mean, he was really hitting the synth hard in this one. Um, but I always think it's fun. The Okana part of it, eh, you know, it's it's, you know, neither here nor there. I, although I do love Bill Campbell because you know, as Carrie mentioned, he is the Rocketeer, and that is one of my all-time favorite movies. Um, so every time I, I look at him, I'm like, oh, yeah, that's right. That's the Rocketeer. But uh, the part that I really like the most is the interaction between Data and Guinan and Data trying to, you know, figure out uh what it is to be funny. Because, you know, we've seen some failed attempts, and and then we have this this you know, guy who comes on the ship and, and reminds data that, no, you're not really that funny. And so he's like, okay, now I got to go figure this out. Um, and I just, I thought that those were some fun moments in the holodeck with him. Um, interesting note about the, uh, the graphic on the door where you see Doug's name and everything. Uh, when we had to update or when we were doing the, remastering of that we actually added a few names to that so doug's name was not in the original uh Ooh. run of the show but uh so some of the names that are on there i think you might even see a douglas e graves i think he was added to the list of comics in there as well um a good friend of mine who is a top-notch mod uh cg modeler but uh anyway the the line that i thought uh was that kind of struck me the most this time was uh at the end there after you know data is realizing that you know okay maybe i'm not that funny you know i don't understand humor but guidance says you know being able to make people laugh or being able to laugh is not the end all and be all of being human and data's response is no but there's nothing more uniquely human and i i thought about that and i that that kind of touched on my own life because I like to laugh and probably I laugh at very inappropriate times and times I shouldn't. Uh, but I remember being in high school and, and sitting there with a group of friends and, and just talking. And I had a friend of mine who said, Oh my gosh, you're a funny guy. And I never really thought about that, but how, I don't know. It is very uniquely human and how, what a, what a fun thing to do. I shouldn't say fun thing to do, but what a, what a meaningful thing to be able to do to make people laugh. Um, and, and, uh, you know, it's a shared experience and hopefully you're not making people laugh at someone else's expense, but, but, you know, why do we watch Saturday night live? Why do we watch comedies? Why do these, you know, these things draw us together and, uh, and, and they lift us up. And I mean, I don't know. I think that's, uh, that's something worthwhile because we all go through uh, not so great moments in our lives and and having those moments and people who surround us who can lift us up and make us laugh are important. Mm. Beautiful. Thanks very much, Mr. Matt Boardman, AKA the Matt Boardman. Look, Jason Oaken is here. The outrageous Okuna. What'd you think of this episode, Jason? Well, uh, this one is a little bit difficult for me. I've always found it a little bit hard to get through it. Uh, it's uh, not one of my favorites. And, you know, one, one thing I always ask myself, what is this all about? And I had a hard time sort of figuring out what is this episode about? I mean, it certainly has the A story and the B story that somewhat connect, but not really. Uh, and which one is the A, which one is the B uh, is another interesting part to me. And then this whole Akana story almost fits in, in, in this kind of 1980s, 1990s pocketbook type novel more than probably an episode uh you know in terms of you know the way O'Connor was done even visually it almost struck me like i was watching the princess bride as opposed to star trek and you know th this has never really set very well with me uh and i wonder it's certainly nice and you know, as we've heard you know to get sort of these slices of life uh, on board the enterprise it certainly has been done better and i think you know if you look at data's day 
it's a hell of a lot better than this. Mm -hmm. And it's taking sort of this part of data and exploring your personality. And it actually carried an episode, the entire episode. And it tied all the stories together. Here we have sort of this, you know, data's humor. I'm not sure that could have carried the entire episode, but this whole issue with O'Connor, it just, it just didn't seem like it was something, you know, frankly worthy of an episode. And I wonder if if this script came up in season three, if Michael Pillar would ever let this get on the air like that, because it's really not about any of our characters. I mean, I, I granted there's some, of, you know, some data here in this humor, but what is this all about? Um, it, it certainly is, again, uh, it has been said kind of stuck in the 80s. And, uh, you know, what I f did find positive and interesting uh, is how sort of the, the jokes and the humor evolved. Because if you look at this, uh, at the, uh, what's called the final uh, draft of the script, it changed quite a bit uh, from what ended up on the screen. A lot of the jokes aren't in there. So certainly, you know, Joe Piscopo may have done his act. And I think some of the stuff that uh, Whoopi and uh, Brent talk about is also not in that script. And I'll say some of that for uh, things left unsaid, that there's quite a few things maybe that should be left unsaid based on that script. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> and, 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 you know, uh, and even visually, frankly, the, you know, this is Robert Becker's, I think, only Star Trek episode. And it felt uh, stilted. It felt sort of static. And I think, you know, the, the, there's a, a scene on the bridge where the camera just stays motionless. Nothing moves for quite a while. And, and the, sort of this medium shot. And I, frankly, the camera moved more in the original series on the bridge than it did here. It, mm -hmm. it, everything just felt kind of static. And uh, uh, it, it just, something was off. Again, it, it's a, it, frankly, what we saw on the screen is a tremendous improvement over what was in the script. Uh, which, you know, I don't know, you know, what, what, what it says about the show itself. Uh, but uh, it's, frankly skippable and uh uh I'll, I'll leave the rest for later and um frankly i am you know uh, I, I think 5.7 sorak is generous so did you like the episode uh jason yeah. uh, <laughs> that was how you really feel <laughs> I loved it. Yeah. Yeah. you mentioned stilted uh stilton's a cheese if i remember correctly Ooh. sorak any Jeez. final thoughts on cheese. this episode uh, the thing I thought of a few days ago for this thing was to have like an action figure of Senator Vreenak and, you know, instead of like, it's a Jake, have it be like, it's his take. But I don't know if that works. That sounds dumb. <laughs> Sirach, what do you think? <laughs> uh, okay. I have a few takes really quick ones. I'll just fly through them. One Picard says, make it so Mr. Crusher. And he actually refers to Wesley as Mr. Crusher. And I actually like that little bit of respect that he gives him. And I actually like the fact that Crusher had a nice uh, uniform on in this episode. I, I don't recall seeing that exact one, but it looked sharp on him. Um, my second take is um, when Worf comes looking for Okana and he kind of walks in on him with the woman. I'm like, well, where's the knock? Where's the doorbell? Uh, you know. The yeah. bed is like literally right in the living room. So this is not a privacy thing. There should have been a moment where there's a, a knock. Like, I know you're in there. Yeah. Come out. Or something. And Some they went right back up. to making out yeah. before he left. Like, they didn't care. They're like, let him watch. Yeah. Who cares? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, I, I just, I think that that doesn't respect people's privacy. Uh, if you're given a cabin, if you're given a spot, you should be able to allow people to come in. And if there's a resistance there, then Worf can use his security authority to break that do door down. Um, I would have liked some reference to some black comics. I think actually this episode would have played better with a black comic. Um, some kind of Red Fox, Richard Pryor type of mm -hmm. character. I think it would have showed more of the disconnect that he has. Uh, like he's just not cool enough to be funny type thing. Um, I would have liked that. And then last thing I'm going to say is, you know, they were making fun of the technology of this, these planets, which by the way, to me was a reuse of a story that they had earlier in this show where twin planets were next to each other and one was selling drugs to the other. Oh, right. And Picard had to resolve that issue. And here we are, twin planets that don't like each other uh it's, it's a reuse of a story and i i didn't like that um 
And then, you know, they were making fun of their laser and their technology. It's like, well, Okana's laser penetrated everyone's shield. And that's my final <laughs> answer. <laughs> Thank you, everybody. Good night. Uh, all right. Well, that's our time, everybody. Very special thanks to my live in Tokyo, Melissa Longo, Carrie Schwent, still undefeated in the Limericks, by the way. Uh, magnificent <laughs> McGee, TJ Jackson, Bay Out Missouri, Bill. I almost went said Bill Victor Arukin because I'm used to reading those down. <laughs> <in> the <list. laughs> because he's right after him in the list. Uh, Dr. Muhammad Noor, uh, Allison Leach Hyde, Faith Howell, Marsha Classic Schreier, Matt Boardman, and of course the outrageous Oak Hunna. Uh, <laughs> been a fun one, everybody. We will uh, see you next time. We'll get this thing squared away for next week. Don't worry, we'll be professional. Uh, what? <laughs> uh, thank Say you all very much. Yeah, for Mr. <laughs> Aaron Eisenberg and myself, Melissa and Sirach, we thank you all. We will see you next time. Until then, always remember the seventh rule. <laughs>